First, uh, Second Kings chapter 4, verses 8 to 17 is our text. Second Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. Let's give our attention to the reading of God's holy word. Now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman, and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was, as often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a man of God passing by us continually. Please let us make a little walled upper chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair with a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes to us that he can turn in there. One day he came there and turned into the upper chamber and rested. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. He said to him, say now to her, behold, you have been careful for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the army? And she answered, I live among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, truly she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. When, she had, when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, at this time next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. The woman conceived and bore a son at that time the next year, as Elisha had said to her. God's holy word, be seated, let's pray together. <coughs> Our eyes look to you, O Lord, and to your word where you have spoken by your spirit. We simply say to you, O Lord, speak for your servants, listen Help us to listen, understand, and obey through your Spirit's help, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Our text this evening is filled with kind-heartedness. First, on the part of the Shunamite, Shun, Shunamite woman, who generously displays her hospitality, to Elisha, and then on the part of the prophet himself, who desires to return that generosity uh, to her, and then finally on, on the part of God himself, uh, who uh, displays his superior generosity to this woman. In our text, we meet a great woman and a great prophet whose noteworthy generosity is overshadowed by the great God's greater generosity. We'll look at two things here. In the first place, a great woman's noteworthy generosity, and second, the great God's greater generosity. So we have in the first place, then, a great woman's Noteworthy generosity. Elijah is passing by Shunem, uh, verse 8, a city in northern Israel about 15 miles south and west of uh, the south tip of the Sea of Galilee. And there we meet another nameless woman uh, who lives at the opposite end of the socio economic spectrum than the widow we met in verses 1 through 7. 
The narrator calls her literally a great woman. That is, a woman of some social standing, prominent in her local community, and a woman of some wealth, evident in, in that she and her husband have not merely one servant, but servants at their disposal. Verses 19 and 22 here in chapter 4 reveal. One day she uh, persuades Elisha to eat at her house, and this begins a regular pattern. Whenever the prophet passes by, he stops there to share a meal, to break bread. During the course of sharing these meals uh, with the prophet, uh, verse 9, the woman becomes convinced that Elisha is a holy man of God. So she persuaded her husband to build an addition uh, to the house, a, a small closed-in room on the roof that could be furnished with necessities, a bed, a chair, a lamp, so that when, uh, when Elisha passed by, he'd not merely have uh, something to eat, but he'd have room and board. Uh, such generosity extended by this wealthy woman is remarkable because quite often the rich are cast in a negative light in Scripture. The New Testament especially issues dire warnings about the pitfalls of wealth. After Christ's encounter with the rich young ruler, uh, who went away grieving, remember, because uh, he had been told to sell all his possessions and, and give them to the poor, Jesus said to his disciples, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul cautions, 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some men by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. James warns, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. You have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. The witness of New Testament scripture, then, is that the pursuit of riches and the love of money leads to temptation, to ruin, apostasy, grief, misery, corruption, and final judgment. And the account of the Shunammite woman stands as an exception to this rule, showing that there's hope for the rich. I'll never forget the time that my U.S. history professor in college characterized Calvinism as the belief that all of God's, uh, all of the rich are uh, God's elect people, and all of the poor are destined for hell. I don't know where he, uh, I don't know where he got that. I don't know where he read that. I don't know where he cleaned that. But that's somehow the conclusion that he had arrived, that he arrived at, that, uh, that, that uh, all the rich were going to heaven, according to Calvinism, and all the poor were going to hell. This wealthy, uh, generous woman shows that God is the God of the rich who hope in him, as well as the believing poor. But this account isn't merely 
about a great woman's generosity. It isn't even primarily about uh, this great woman's generosity. It's even more so about the great God's greater generosity. Uh, Elisha wanted to reciprocate uh, the Shunammite woman's generosity. On one of his visits, uh, he had Gehazi, uh, his servant, summon her to see what he might do for her, what the prophet might do for her. Could he put in a good word to, uh, for her to, to the king or uh, the captain uh, of the army? Verse 13, she refuses the offer. I live among my own people. That is, I have everything I need right here in my own community, my own clan. The prophet and his servant confer, verse 14, what to do for a woman who has everything. Gehazi has a suggestion. The woman has no son, and her husband is old. And so Elisha has... A his servant summoned the other woman back and announces as she stands in the doorway, at this time next year, you will embrace a son. A woman, uh, as you might imagine, is uh, incredulous. Can't believe. Uh, oh, man of God, don't lie uh, to your maidservant. But the Bible is not... Uh, incredulous. The, it doesn't share the woman's incredulity, announcing in its matter-of-fact manner in verse 16, the woman conceived and bore a son at that time the next year, as Elisha had said to her. Now, students of the Bible know that this isn't the first time this kind of thing's happened. In fact, there's a phrase in verses 16 and 17, next year, that only appears in one other passage in Genesis 18, verses 10 and 14, the account of another birth that seemed impossible because Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and Sarah was past the years of childbearing and was sure that she couldn't have children. After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, she said, my Lord being old also? It's as if the use of this phrase next year is a direct pointer to that passage in Genesis 18. And that brings uh, to mind the whole biblical pattern, the barren woman who gives birth. It's a remarkable pattern in Scripture. It begins in the period of the patriarchs with the, the, the account of Sarah there in Genesis uh, 18, really Genesis 11 to 21. It's a long a drawn-out saga. Then we meet Isaac's wife, Rebecca, who was childless through 20 years of marriage. Genesis 25, 19 to 26. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebecca conceived and gave birth to Esau and Jacob. Then comes Rachel. Genesis 29, 31 to 30, uh, 31 through th uh, 29, 31 through 30, 24, uh, who remained childless through the long stretch of years when her sister, sister Leah and both of their maids were bearing children to Jacob until at last she gave birth to Joseph. In the period of the judges, we meet Manoah's wife, who was barren until the Lord opened her womb, and she gave birth to Samson. Now, then comes 
childless Hannah. For Samuel 1, out of whose tears and prayers comes Israel's last judge, Samuel. Next, in the days of the kings, comes the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4. And then it's not until Luke 1 that we meet a priest named Zacharias and his wife who had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both old and advanced in years. But the Lord said an angel to tell this priest that his wife would bear a son and they ought to name him John. However, 2 Kings 4 is unique among all of these instances of the barren women pattern. In all other cases, either the birth of the child is for uh, is, is essential for the preserving of the covenant line, or the child becomes a significant leader in a time of crisis for uh, Israel. Had Isaac and Jacob not been born, the line of the covenant people would have been snuffed out. Without Joseph, Jacob's family would have perished uh, in the famine. In both instances, the line of, of the Messiah is preserved. No Jacob, no Christ. No Joseph, no Jesus, who would save his people from their sins. God raised up Samson to preserve Israel from uh, the Philistines in a time when they were in, uh, in great danger, uh, when God's people were in great danger. Samuel held Israel together during a, a very turbulent uh, transition from the period of judges to the monarchy. And John the Baptist, we know as the forerunner to, uh, of Jesus Christ, to preparing his people for their long expected Messiah. None of this applies to this child in 2 Kings 4. The birth of this child isn't essential to national covenant preservation, to the preservation of the Messiah's line. Uh, it's not essential to uh, Israel's continuity as God's people, nor does he become an outstanding leader or a prominent figure in Israel's life. So what's the point here in 2 Kings 4? Sometimes Jehovah gives such a gift, not for the purpose of fulfilling some grand redemptive historical function, but simply because he wants to make a woman happy with a child. Psalm 113.9, he makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. The point is that God delights to give you good gifts, not because you're prominent or useful, but simply because he's a God who richly supplies us with all good things to enjoy. Paul says, 1 Timothy 6, 17, the Belgic Confession makes this point in Article 1 when it calls God the overflowing fountain of all good. Frequently, the Father gives gifts to his servants simply to make them happy, to bring joy uh, to their lives, and his generosity far exceeds ours in gift-giving. 
It's Jesus who makes this point in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 to 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Which one of you, if he asks his son for bread, will give him a, uh, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? Given that our Father is a superior gift giver, what should we be asking of him? Shall we be content asking for the lesser things that pertain to our earthly sustenance? Luke's parallel in chapter 11 of his gospel to uh, Matthew chapter 7 provides us with the right perspective. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And that brings us uh, to the consideration of our great God's greatest generosity, uh, which extends far beyond the gift of a child to a barren woman and every good thing and every perfect gift from above coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And thanks be to God that it does extend beyond those ordinary gifts, shall we call them, of this life. If the Father only gave us good things during our brief sojourn through uh, this world, our, our happy, happier and a more comfortable existence on earth would only tragically lead to a miserable existence in hell forever. Thanks be to God that he's given us much more than simply good things to enjoy in this life. Rather than leaving us to our own devices, which would lead to suffering in the next God's greatest gift uh, is his son. It's that simple truth that, we, uh, that many of us learned in a Sunday school class, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then our Father even gift wraps for us the very means of salvation the instrument of our justification. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no, no man uh, can boast. Thanks be to God indeed for the greatest gift, the greatest act of his greatest act of generosity to his uh, believing people, his gift to us and uh, to our children and our children's children after us and their children in giving us his only begotten son and in giving us the Holy Spirit as a down payment of the salvation which he has wrought for us in our Savior, Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, receive our thanks for the gifts that you give to us. We would not minimize those good and precious gifts that you are pleased to lavish upon us in this life, the temporal things that, that belong to this life and this world, uh, some of which we need. Uh, the very essentials of, of life, 
you are pleased to give to your people? But, O oh Lord, we thank you for Christ. Forgive us for taking, taking for granted uh, the, great, uh, the great gift uh, uh, of your only begotten Son, the costliness of, of that gift. We thank you for Christ and for the gift of your Holy Spirit who indwells us, who fleshes out Christian fruits in our hearts and who illuminates our hearts and minds in your word. We thank you, O God, for all of the precious gifts that you give to us and especially uh, those invaluable gifts, spiritual gifts, gifts that come down from heaven above, <coughs> spreading out a table before us, furnishing that table with delights, heavenly delights. Teach us, O oh Lord, to revel in, in our spiritual heritage of the inheritance that you've granted to us in our Lord Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.